Welcome to this breakout session for MPC Ignites on the history of philanthropy. This conversation is being recorded during Black History Month, which runs for October and celebrates the achievements of black people and their contributions to the UK over many generations. This is a pre-recorded session, so we can't respond live to any questions, but we will be monitoring the page this video is posted on. So please feel free to add questions or observations in the comments below or on social media uh, and we'll reply. If you're using Twitter, please use the hashtag MPC Ignites. And if you're interested in the session, you might also be interested in the Mirror uh, panel discussion on the future of philanthropy uh, with Fran Perrin on day two of the conference. So I'm really pleased today to be joined by some great speakers. Uh, so we have Rodri Davis, who's head of policy at, at CAF. We have Dr. Sarah Flew, who's Deputy Director of Development at Imperial College London. And we have Maureen Grant, uh, who's a community activist. So thank you very much all for coming today. I'm personally really interested in the discussions today uh, as a bit of a philanthropy geek mm -hmm. and as somebody with a history degree, although it's not in philanthropy. <laughs> um, but I'm, so I'm really excited to, to explore some of the, the issues today and, and hear what our speakers have to say. Um, and I'm just going to hand over the floor now um, to speakers to introduce, introduce themselves and say a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing and the organisations that you come from. So, Rodri, can I invite you to start? Uh, of course, and thanks very much for, for having me. It's great to have the opportunity to uh, sit down and totally geek out about the history of philanthropy because it's not something I get to do as much as I would like. Um, but yeah, I'm head of policy in my day job at CAF and I also run Giving Thought, which is the kind of in-house think tank that we have there. And I do the podcast, the Giving Thought podcast for CAF. Um, I guess in terms of the history, the, the reason that I'm here is I wrote a book back in 2015 called Public Good by Private Means, How Philanthropy Shapes Britain, which is kind of all about the history of philanthropy in the UK and how it can inform current thinking about philanthropy and policymaking. And ever since then, I've been absolutely hooked on the history of philanthropy, not as a historian by background. Um, the other relevant thing, I guess, still, I do a lot of stuff on history in my day-to-day -day work, but I also run a Twitter feed called Philiteracy, which is all about the history of philanthropy and kind of interesting writing about philanthropy. Great. Thank you, Rodri. Sarah, could I invite you to introduce yourself? So I'm an active um, fundraiser. So I've fundraised for schools and two great universities, so LSE and now Imperial College. Um, I have a, a PhD in the history of philanthropy. I've always been really interested in how money is raised for charities. And I've been treasurer myself of a few small charities. And I've also done, you know, the awful sort of school PTA fundraising, which involves roller skating infant school children. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And Maureen, could I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yes. OK, so I'm Maureen Grant and I'm... Uh... I'm retired and I've retired from Joseph Frank Tree Charitable Trust where I've worked for uh, nearly 20 years. And during that time, I worked on uh, the racial justice program, the West Yorkshire racial justice program. And I also was, um, I also led the program on environmental issues, which is sustainable future. So, but outside of that, I am a presenter for, um, a volunteer presenter for a community radio station. So that keeps me occupied. And um, I, I'm doing a, a series of interviews during Black History Month. So I, I'm, I'm busy with that. As soon as I leave here, I have to do another and so on. So that, that's keeping me occupied. And, and I produce my own show also, which is called Race Matters. Um, I also am um, trustee for a voluntary sector organization. Well, it's not a voluntary sector organization, it's an international organization called Not One More, concerned with environmental justice. And also um, I'm, uh, I'm treasurer for a small community organization in Bradford where I live. Um, so I'm kind of actively involved in community work and have been on both sides of the fence, both giving out funds as well, well not giving out, me giving out, but actually being part of that process of gives out funds, as well as applying for funding. So I've um, experienced on both sides of the fence. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. 
And actually that that sort of experience from both sides of the fence is, is uh, you know, from you and, and from Sarah, I think is a really nice place to start because, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in NPC at the moment is, um, is questions around power dynamics between funders and grantees. And I suppose one of the things that I'm really interested in is, you know, to what extent do you think that some of these power dynamics are rooted in historical attitudes um, around philanthropy, you know, these questions of the deserving and undeserving poor, the need to be grateful for funding. You know, how do you think some of those historical attitudes and approaches uh, have influenced the power dynamics that we see today? I wonder if I could go to you first, Sarah. So I think the, the concepts of the, the deserving and undeserving poor um, just have persisted since they were created, really. In the 19th century, you know, the idea of workhouses were deliberately created to be as appalling as possible so that people just really wouldn't go want to go into them. So that's why the sexes, the genders were divided and you'd have a men's wing and, and a women's wing. So the family would be deliberately, um, you know, torn apart um, because there's this idea that there are some deserving poor who are just, you know, deserving of our charity because they've fallen on hard times, but yet there's the undeserving poor who are just poor because they're idle. And you can see that sort of narrative is still perpetuated today in sort of tabloid newspapers, particularly around, you know, large families who have five, eight, 10 children and they're all on benefits and yet they'll have a sky dish you know, on the front of their house. But these are a tiny minority of the population, but I think the tabloid, particularly tabloid newspapers, try and amplify their existing and make it sound like all of the working class, all of the poor are, you know, undeserving. Thank you, that's really interesting. I wonder if Maureen, I wonder what your response is mm. to to that, you know, and also, you know, drawing on your experience from both sides of the fence of, of, of the sort of power dynamics and, and where the root of those comes from. Yeah, um, uh, from my point of view, I think power, it, it, it's central almost to all of this. And, and I think in the way in which the world is made, the world, the world exists, um, particularly I'm talking from a black perspective in terms of you know, if, if you look at the roots of where philanthropy, the, the, of, of a lot of philanthropy and where the money comes from, um, mm -hmm. we, 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 we have an unequal world and this world did not become unequal by accident. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's become unequal in order to empower, to enrich some folk. And in order to enrich some folk, it makes others poorer. Um, so if you look at the history of, um, of capitalism, for example, you have a capitalist world that is really built on the, on, on the, um, the resources of another. And that happens today. So, you know, you don't even have to think about slavery in order to see the trajectory, you know, where that's ended up, basically. And if we look at today's world, so we have this situation where money is earned. We have um, a, a process by which power is, is um, you want to maintain that power if you if you felt you've earned that power and money is power. Um, and then in, in, in terms of how that translates into giving money out to others, it, there's definitely that sense of we can decide who gets and who doesn't get. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we operate as uh, that's the way all, all philanthropy operate. You decide who gets. And that often is narrowly based on what your understanding of is of deserving, um, you know, dare an organization to operate outside those boundaries or to offer something culturally different, it's not valued. And I think that's really important and seen over and over again in the way um, money is dished out to, um, to, to good causes. 
good causes are designed, are, are um, uh, you know, as a narrow band of people decide what good causes are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and if we look at the makeup, there's, there's been lots of debates uh, about over the, uh, the last couple of years about the makeup of um, the boards that give out money and so on. And they, they tend to be mostly white. There's a high percentage. I can't at the top of my head think what that percentage is, but it's it is a is a problem that this the sector has been talking about in recent times. I don't think it's gone away. I mean, in this panel here, we've got me. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you very much. And, that, and I think that's a really inter interesting observation about this problem about you know the decision makers on who decides who's deserving and who gets the money is still very narrow both in terms of number um and you know how that number is made up um and i think you know that's definitely something um that the charity sector sort of uh experiences and is certainly reflected in some of the grant making practices that, that we see Rodri, I wonder if you, you know, if I could ask you to comment on on that, but also some, I wonder, some thoughts on, you know, how some of these existing narrow structures and um, perspectives might be disrupted. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, there's a, a lot to pick up on what both Sarah and Maureen said. I'll try not to replicate it. I guess my, my thought when I was listening to that was that, it always seems to me when you look at the history of philanthropy that that at its heart, if you if you view kind of one of the central things that that philanthropy is aiming to do to solve poverty in some sense, the the view on what the fundamental of nature of poverty is is really important. And I think at two ends of a spectrum, you have a view that poverty represents a kind of moral individual failing. It's simply a kind of lack of moral character or, or failing of effort on the part of the individual. Or at the other end of the spectrum, it's positioned as something that reflects structural inequalities that aren't the fault of the individual and they are sort of the victim of. And I think if you take that latter view, you very much approach the solution of poverty as something to do with justice. So it is the right of the individual to demand justice because they have been unfairly treated by the system. Whereas if you believe that the system is sort of fundamentally okay and that capitalism works up to a point you're probably then talking about staying within the system but using philanthropy or charity as a way of addressing you know the, the problems of poverty and getting people to a slightly better position than they were otherwise and I think that's where the danger comes in that you put the power in the hands of the donor to make decisions about how best to address those causes who are the deserving or undeserving recipients of their largesse um, and I think beyond that, you get kind of uh, interesting questions and people getting very caught up in ideas about the, you know, that it's worse to give indiscriminately than it is to give at all. So for large periods of, of time in sort of the history of philanthropy, donors were spending a lot of their efforts thinking about whether they should just not give at all because that was better than giving to people who are undeserving and thereby kind of perpetuating a life in which they sort of relied on philanthropy. Um, I guess in response to your question there, bringing it up to the present day, I think what's really interesting at this moment in time is some of those questions there about the distinction between charity and justice and kind of whether we need to fundamentally rethink the ways that we do philanthropy to, to recognise those challenges and also to kind of shift power dynamics really seem to be happening. And I think the focus on things like participatory models that try to put the decision-making power about where money goes in the hands of the communities that are actually um, the, the ones who are kind of suffering from the challenges um, or kind of need uh, to have their demands for justice met are really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot more talk about participatory philanthropy than there is actual action at the moment. So I think there's a, a huge amount more to be done, but, but I think there's some really kind of encouraging signs on that front. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. And I, I certainly agree with you that I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in participatory grant making at the moment. Um, but I think there's lots of questions from grant makers on how they go about making that work uh, for them. Um, but, you know, certainly hoping that people start to, um, you know, embrace some of those um, some of those methods and, and definitely make more use of lived experience within the work that they do. Um, and have greater representation in decision-making positions. I wonder if Sarah Maureen, whether you had any thoughts on, 
on this question of you know having explored this historical attitude you know expanding on what Rodri's explored in terms of how we disrupt that in the way that we're working today um should I go first yeah okay sure. so so basically I think um there are lots of things that can happen. We talk about participatory um, fundraising, fund, for, um, uh, funding. Um, so I think that's an obvious one. But I think also what, what is clear is that if the people who are essentially making decisions about um, the, 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 what to give out and how to give it out and how much to give and so on, is not reflective of the people that you are trying to, to, to essentially trying to, to help. Um, I think you are always there's always going to be poor decisions, um, not because the people that don't want to, to do well, but because you just don't think of the, the things that you can be thinking of if you had those people in with a lived ex experience in the room, and I think that that's that's essential. So I think who is staffing, who the staff of those places are essential. And also the, the, the board that makes up the decision makers, making is essential. And um, I know some places do call on people to in a, a, like a, a committee setting. So they call on the experience of, experiences of people with lived experience. But I think that's, unsatisfactory in a way, because you're already setting up a two-tier system. How much say have they really got? You, you hear from them, but then you, you make the decision. And I think that's not really that satisfactory. It helps, but it's not um, as good as it could be. So on, until um, the whole structure of, of, of philanthropy is is, is actually looked at carefully and actually dismantled to present itself in a different way. I think that these problems will persist. Um, and also it does mean actually um, kind of doing some real soul searching. So it's the soul searching of the sector, what it's doing and how it, how it means to go on. And until that hard job is done, I think, you know, it is really hard to move out of that um, process, I think. Um, I mean, it sounds negative, but I think th there's a, a lot of work to be done. The good news is that the sector is beginning to, has already begun to ask itself these questions. So I think that, um, perhaps um, it, it will move. And I think with the recent um, uh, resurgence of questions about racism and so on, maybe it might you know, move fa a little faster than it might otherwise have moved. So I, I think there's hope, but um, a long way to go. So I'm gonna answer as a fundraiser. I think as a fundraiser, you should always be cause led and not donor led. I mean, obviously, there's you have to meet in the middle to a certain extent because you're trying to create a partnership. But I, I think as the charity, as the cause, you are the experts and you do know what's best to do. And sometimes the philanthropist's idea is not the best idea and you shouldn't just go along with it just because they want to give you a large sum of money. So um, to take an example of that, I know a lot of people who are wanting to come up with um, solutions to climate change you know the trendy thing is let's plant a, a forest but a lot of forests are being planted without any expert advice I mean you want when you plant a forest because you want to take carbon out of the atmosphere you want to create that right ecosystem in the forest you don't want to just plant 2,000 oak trees and think well I've solved the problem so I do think I do think that Although philanthropists have the power that they should listen to experts and not just run away with their own pet projects. Yeah. Yes, Maureen. And um, and I, I I absolutely agree with you, Sarah, and that. Um, uh, but I also uh, and I also think that um, 
the, it is about being careful about how you select those experts and, and, and what, how you define what an expert is. Because sometimes we, we think of um, experts in, in the way that you know, we, we've grown used to seeing experts. Um, I'm not saying to dismiss anybody's expertise, but you, it has to be a wide band of expertise, not only um, the, edu- the professor or, or you know, the researcher, whatever the case might be, experts come from down on the ground too. Yeah. Um, I just, Very important uh, point. Yeah, and, and add, adding to that, I absolutely agree on the question around diversifying what we are w- willing to think of as, as expertise. I think also in terms of how we the narrative that we have about what constitutes um success in philanthropy or how philanthropists should be viewed as being you know thoughtful or strategic because i think that the the paradigm up to now has been you know you have to prove as a philanthropist that you are the one that can bring your business acumen or whatever to the table and come up with solutions that nobody else could have done and it's this sort of myth of the the, the hero entrepreneur philanthropist and actually somebody who says do you know what the best way for me to do good with my money would be to give it away to other people who actually understand the problems better if if that is viewed as somehow being a lesser form of philanthropy or you know god forbid charity rather than philanthropy those people for whom philanthropy is a matter of kind of pride and ego as much as anything else that's not going to be very appealing but I think on that front, what's really interesting is to see examples like Mackenzie Scott in the US, who um, recently made you know, an enormous um, uh, announcement about her philanthropy with the money that she'd had after um, her divorce from Jeff Bezos. But the model that she was using was very much one that said, I have chosen some groups that I think are doing work and they're led by people of color and people of kind of indigenous communities. And I'm just giving their money, no strings attached to do work with it. And yes, there are all sorts of questions to be answered about whether that will prove to be strategic and effective and all those sorts of things. But actually in terms of a sort of fundamental shift of the narrative of what the role of the philanthropist is in all of this, I found that fascinating and I would hope to see a lot more of that. Yeah, and I really, I've always been a fan of Warren Buffett's approach that instead of setting up his own charitable foundation, he just gives a proportion of his shares each year to the Gates Foundation and then distributes the rest amongst his three children. Mm. Yeah, um, I I, I mean, there's there's merit, there's absolute merit in that approach, um, uh, because often um, what came to mind is... um, uh, as you were talking, is that basically sometimes funders tend to to um, decide how much money is good is is is, is um, essential for this bit of work, and that's really um, my ex- everything about my experience tells me that that is so um, misguided. Um, First of all, we on the on the value, e- even from our own standards, we think that another person should be spending less money on something that we might spend more money on, and so so, so you already start with that. Um, you know, they, they should make do with that. You know, that's the that comes across in the attitude. Sometimes you should make do with that, um, and actually, is setting people up to fail essentially. So, um, and then there are all the strings attached. I think we, we talked about that um, earlier in the conversation about the, the strings that are attached to um, the, the, the bit of money that we get, which can possibly do the things that you're being expected to do. And I think that there, there is something about freeing that up and liberating people to do um, the work that is that, that they want to do and is essential for them to do. I think there are some really interesting points here around, you know, deliberately funding for success, um, mm-hmm. you know, funding generously um, and funding to solve problems rather than sort of making incremental improvements. So sort of making some bigger bets, um, decisions around philanthropy that I think are are really interesting and um, and really nice, as you say, Rodri, to see some examples of that um, recently in the press and and you know hopefully get people thinking around their philanthropy and and their approach. 
I did have a, another question which um, sort of circles us back in the conversation a little bit um, to something that uh, you raised earlier, Maureen, around this issue of where philanthropic money has come from. Um, and I, I know this is a, a sort of heavy issue that lots of charities grapple with. And that's a question of sort of in inverted quotes or uninverted quotes is bad money. You know, mm -hmm. can you put bad money to good use? Should charities allow it? Um, and do those grant makers in question, you know, have particular responsibilities around how they're deploying resources that they have um, that, that come from questionable routes um, or routes which are, are unethical? So I'm going to put that out to you first, Rodri, because I do know that you've recently blogged on this question. Mm. So I'm um, curious to, to have your thoughts. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I guess I think the think, thinking particularly about the historical perspective here, I think the history of philanthropy is really relevant to this in, in at least kind of two main ways. I mean, the first is that this is a theme that runs right through the heart of philanthropy since about as far back as you go. I mean, I kind of I dug up some stuff that the Venerable Bede had said um, back in the Middle Ages. So it's, there's a whole thing from the Council of Cloveso in 746, where there was a church decree about uh, arms given from uh, unjustly plundered uh, or otherwise extracted money um, through force or cruelty shouldn't be considered acceptable. Um, and then you look at like the, the construction of Notre Dame. There's a really good uh, anecdote about a group of prostitutes who decided, French prostitutes at the time, Brazilians, who decided to give money towards that. And there was a whole hoo-ha and they had to get in uh, this person called Peter the Chanter to uh, decide whether ethically it was okay for the church to accept that money from that tainted source. And they pragmatically decided it was as long as nobody knew that's where it had come from. And, and those kinds of conversations continue I think through, you know, through philanthropy at all levels, right through to, I think, the most obvious examples of the kind of gilded age in America, where people like Rockefeller and Carnegie were subject to enormous criticism at the time because they were giving a lot of money, yes, but people knew perfectly well that the business practices they were employing were monopolistic. They often employed strike-breaking tactics, including kind of violence. And in one point, in one case in point with Carnegie, I think people were killed at a strike. And so people sort of said, you know, if we question where this money has come from, what does that say about the legitimacy of their efforts to do good through giving it away? So I think understanding that historical context and how people have grappled with those questions is really informative because it doesn't seem to me we've actually moved on especially far in terms of those ethical questions. I guess the other area, and it'd be interesting to come on to, is that there are at the moment particularly specifically historical examples of tainted money. And I'm thinking particularly here about all of the light that's been shone recently, which I think is absolutely great, on fortunes that were amassed in some way through the profits made through the slave trade and what we do about that money, what we do about the, the ways in which we've chosen to commemorate it, particularly where people who had made their money in that way also were notable philanthropists and the question of whether actually we should continue to celebrate them for their philanthropy or actually we need to take into account the damage that they were doing through how they made that money and that that actually kind of uh, takes away from from our ability to appreciate the the good that they've done with the money they've given away um and this is part of a much wider and obviously quite divisive conversation at the moment but one that i think is vital for philanthropy to grapple with absolutely and it, you know it is a really big challenge for for charities and i think there is you know certainly tension for charities as well as they they're keen to consider funds but also don't want the source of those funds to be something that is working contrary to their mm -hmm. charitable objectives as well and that you know that's of course a a reputational responsibility for the trustees to consider at the same time sarah i wonder if i could invite you to to comment on this question of sort of bad money for good use you know is it possible and what are the responsibilities for for funders as they're thinking about it and you know also from the perspective of a fundraiser is what are the responsibilities of those seeking those funds so i've got an interesting example from the irish potato famine so a lot of the the relief in ireland was through the quakers and the quaker committee um almost split over the issue about whether they should take funding from charleston in south Carolina because there was a big Irish community there but of course they were getting their money through plantations 
which had slaves on and it nearly split the committee because one committee member said they were bloodstained contributions but in the end they took it to the vote and the majority opinion was well there are people dying in in Ireland we're better to take the money um I think the problem with today, though, is when charities decide whether to take a money from, you know, bad money. It's more about a brand, um, brand association. How would this look in the newspapers? Would it, you know, if we take money, this bad money, will it impact on our fundraising? You know, will it create a bad story? And I do think that that is more the issue today. Um, I think there was a, uh, in the 19th century, there was a really interesting movement around, called the Systematic Beneficence Society. So it was all about how people should give their money systematically. And you should, so William Gladstone is a good example of this, Prime Minister, at the start of the year, you should look at what your income is going to be this year, set aside your 10% and then decide thoughtfully how you're going to give it away during the year, that you shouldn't just be giving your philanthropy in an impulsive way just because somebody asks you. You should be strategic in your philanthropy and give it to causes that really matter to you rather than just being torn this way that way because you're asked to give to the donkeys you're asked to give to the local charity you're asked to give to the opera um, and you should be strategic yeah very important point thanks sarah and i think there's also a point in there about you know once you found those areas that are really of interest to you what are the most effective ways of tackling those problems um you know it's you know not all philanthropy is necessarily created equal um, you know, as a philanthropist, you do have a responsibility to give as well as possible to the most effective um, charities that are doing the best work. Maureen, I'm really keen to, to draw on your insights on this, particularly as a person that sort of raised it first in the conversation. Um, and I wondered what, what your perspective was. Well, if we talk about good money and bad money, I think we, uh, uh, we have to recognise that um, a lot of the money in the system will disappear if we stop giving out mm -hmm. bad. So that's the first thing to acknowledge. Um, I think that um, there is a responsibility on um, philanthropy to kind of think about that process. And um, there, is, there is evidence that that is taking place. For, so for example, um, how you might invest, say, for example, are you investing in things that are going to make the world a worse place than it already is? Or So there, there is that side of it. But if we take the example of, um, let's say, the proceeds from slavery and think about where it goes, I mean, I, I think all that money should be going to addressing the social problems that it has caused. It's all, the money has already been made, so put it to good use. Um, so I, from that point of view, I think um, that would definitely be seen as bad money being used in philanthropy, but I think there's a role for it there. Um, but in terms of how in today's world, how we move forward, there is a responsibility of thinking, where is your money coming from? And, and I, I guess, you know, you can take that to extremes. So for example, is lottery money coming from gambling? Is that right? You know, so there's a moral, a moral question there to ask. So I think it, it, it's not an easy thing to, to, to conclude on, but I think there's, um, I, I, I think there's room to continue debating that and asking ourselves the question, and and feeling that ma making sure that you 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 feel that it's morally right to put that this, get this money from here and put it here. So I think there's there are always questions. It's not going to go away. Um, in our current system of operation, it's not going to go away. Those questions will remain. And there's a really good example of that. There was a family foundation. It might've been a corporate foundation in Europe last year that discovered that the family wealth actually had um, Nazi origins, so they re reoriented all of the their charitable funding to Jewish causes. 
I was I was just going to say as well, I think there's an interesting link back here to what we were talking about before around power, because it always strikes me when you're thinking through the question of whether or not a charity can feel it's acceptable to take money from a tainted source on the basis that it's better to do good with it and take it away from from where that taint has happened. It really it really asks questions about the retains over how that money is distributed and whether they get recognition for it so i think a donor who is stipulating how money is spent and demanding naming rights well it's very clear to me that in that case they are getting a tangible benefit and it's probably very questionable whether the charity should be happy with that relationship whereas if a donor who, who recognizes perhaps that their money is tainted in some sense gives it with no expectation of control or recognition, then the question of whether actually the charity would be better to accept it becomes much more of a grey area, I think. So so I think that question of power is, is actually really relevant to, to this one of tainted money. I think drawing on that as well, there's also a, an interesting question around purpose in terms of the grant. You know, what was the what was the purpose and the goal for giving that grant? Was it genuinely to um, address the social problems that are either related to how that money was sourced or to address a social problem that the grant maker cares about? Or was it something more related to a sort of reputational, um, reputational buoyancy? Um, so I think there's also interesting questions of purpose in there as well. But I think those are all tied to questions of recognition and power, as you say. So another example of someone who almost changed, who has definitely changed his name in history is Nobel. Nobel, you know, is famous for the Peace Prize, but he was actually involved in the invention of dynamite and the, the deaths of lots of people. Mm. Yeah, uh, um, the, 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 the recent example that really comes to mind is, um, I mean, the, the, this, is, this has been usually publicized, so I don't think I'm saying anything that is um, out of order, but um, the theater world um, have been, um, there's been lots of controversy about taking money from the oil companies and the um, argument is that the oil companies want to actually, it's a clear example of them trying to um, clear, clean up their brand, if you like, mm -hmm. associated itself with theatre, um, the arts, you know, um, nice, comfortable, you know, it's all of that. So that, that, that's an example of how cleaning money, I suppose, and then, and, and lots of theatres, in fact, have actually decided to reject that money on that basis. That I could see that, you know, that's a tangible example of how this could, the thinking behind it, and they work to kind of decide what to take or not take is really important. Absolutely. Really interesting thoughts on, on that. Thank you very much indeed. So I, I have one more question, which I think is something that we sort of touched on a little bit um, with our conversation about Mackenzie Scott earlier. Um, and that is sort of the question around, you know, is philanthropy going full circle? Are we seeing a re-emergence of old attitudes and behaviours? Or do we think philanthropy is going to a new phase? Or do we think it's the same as it's been for the last 20, 30, 50 years. Curious to get your thoughts. Rodri, I wonder if I can start with you again. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's a kind of a good and a bad version of this in that I think examples like Mackenzie Scott as, as a case in point, but also the broader focus at the moment on the relationship between philanthropists and philanthropic foundations and social movements which is where i think there's some really fascinating stuff happening but people are also increasingly aware that those dynamics are quite challenging and that actually they they absolutely shine you know the harshest possible light on these issues of kind of power and what it genuinely means to shift power and some of the sort of uncomfortable realities of what that means for people having to give that away um and i think that's that's the good side of it in that if what we're doing there is returning to some sort of, you know, um, Garden of Eden, where actually we're kind of 
uh, getting away from the idea that we have to have these highly structured forms of philanthropy where all the power is in the hands of donors and we look to them to provide the answers for society, then, you know, I for one would be delighted. I think the, the other area in which I think there's a really interesting phenomenon of coming full circle back to kind of more historical approaches to giving is in the impact that technology is having on the ways in which people are able to give. So I think there is a kind of wide scale process of disintermediation where platforms, digital platforms are increasingly kind of allowing people to give directly to individuals more than organizations. And we're seeing this in the areas of things like crowdfunding. And in some ways that's hugely empowering. Um, it might be more motivating for the donor. It might kind of drive more empathy and human connection, and that might be positive. But the flip side is that it's reintroducing all of those human biases and kind of both conscious and unconscious that in some ways charities and other intermediaries were kind of put in place to overcome. And, we're, you know, in crowdfunding, we're seeing that in there's a lot of interesting evidence around medical crowdfunding where it's not the actual genuine most deserving cases in terms of medical severity that end up doing well. It's those that fit the bill in terms of racial profile or are most uh, kind of successful in using social media tools or have the most you know the strongest existing connections and it doesn't seem to me that those are good bases on which to make decisions about who does or doesn't receive money and if technology is sort of speeding that process and reintroducing all of those bad things that we've hopefully got some distance away from then I think we need to think quite long and hard about how we stop that and as we disintermediate, we make sure that we do it in such a way that we're not reintroducing all of those old problems. Thank you. Maureen, I wonder if I could go to you. Well, um, I think they, hmm, the, 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 this is a difficult one, but I think that, um, sadly, I think that they, it's, it, it feels as though it's pretty much, everything intact, all the same as it always was. Um, I, I know that sounds like a very negative thing to say, but why I say that is because I think structurally, th there might be tinkering here and there, but structurally it is still the same um, and we will come out with the same outcomes um, unless those there's a disruption in the structural nature of philanthropy. Um, I mean, for example, um, there's been a discussion around, there's been huge discussions around how, you know, how, how you link all of this to sort of um, social movements that are kind of where maybe change are form, the, the, what needs to be changes of form. And, um, but yet there are at the same time debates going on with the charity commission in terms of the restrictions that are placed upon charities to actually um, contribute to certain types of work. And, and the, the, I can't see that there's been enough of a shift in any position to kind of make those changes real. So to me, it feels as though we are, there, there's been huge amounts of discussion and debate in the sector in the past five years or so around many of these issues. But in terms of actual changing the, 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 you know, the way of it all to make that change happen. I don't see that shift. Thanks, Maureen. Sarah, what's your take? Particularly for um, the fundraising side, I suppose, as well. So I both like and don't like the effective altruism movement. I like it because it encourages people to be thoughtful and deliberate in their philanthropy but what I don't like about it is it's too health focused because you know you know for if you give $30 you can save you know stop somebody going blind so it's a very metrics data um, led thought type of philanthropy and therefore it, it doesn't really encourage people to give to those difficult issues like violence against women because you you know you can't give $30 to a cause that does 
violence, you know, that tries to stop violence against women and know what the result, the impact of your philanthropy will be. But I like the fact that it makes people think about their philanthropy. Um, the two sort of trends that interest me in philanthropy at the moment are one sort of big bet philanthropy, sort of exemplified by Chuck Feeney, who, you know, who when he gave away the final um, billion dollars of his eight billion dollar fortune that he gave away, thought about the big issues that he wanted to tackle and then gave money to causes in large amounts. That's a very American led trend. And, and then the other trend I like that's new in philanthropy is sort of collaborative philanthropy where you, so so it's organizations like co-impact the the sister organization of rockefeller how various philanthropists have come together on a cause or another example would be the new clean air fund which i think is um about six different foundations interested in air pollution and you know they've come together to to almost do a, a, their own version of big bet philanthropy, they put a big amount of money behind an issue and they're working together on it. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with collaboration and actually bringing different sectors almost together to kind of tackle a problem because nothing is one dimensional. And I, I think that's, that's so important. Absolutely. And in fact, that leads me on to my final question for, for each of you. Um, and actually, you may have already answered it to some extent already, but you know, bearing on, in mind our conversation today, what do you think is the most important action funders can take when they're thinking about their philanthropy and thinking about giving responsibly and doing it well? Um, What's the sort of top one or two things that you would like them to not just think about, but to do? Maureen, can I go to you first? Yeah, okay. Well, I think that um, the, the most important thing that um, they could do is actually um, understand and acknowledge that um, they are not the experts in the things that they want to fund and they need to have the experts making decisions, involved in the decision-making in a real way, not in a patronizing way or in a periphery way, but in a real, be central to making those decisions. So that's what I, would, I think I would like to see happen. And that to me would be an important change to make. Thank you. Sarah, can I come to you? My advice would be one, choose one cause and fund that. Don't, don't scatter your philanthropy thinly across multiple causes. You know, that might make you feel good, but it's not having the most impact. Thank you. Rodri? Yeah, I mean, just the couple of things I'd say, which probably reflects a lot of the conversation we've had, I think more for individual donors than foundations, but probably for them too. I think contextualizing philanthropy is increasingly important. I think philanthropy doesn't exist in a vacuum and understanding where money has come from, how it is invested, who it, who it is that has power and say over how that money um, is is spent is is absolutely crucial. And I think, you know, relating to things like whether sufficient tax has been paid on it and what the relationship between that is and the legitimacy of giving it away. So I think philanthropy needs to be put in the proper context before we assess whether or not it is good or bad philanthropy. Um, I guess the, the other two things, I would do, totally agree with the point that's been made by both Sarah and Maureen about collaboration. I think putting aside the ego of the funder or the individual philanthropist and not seeking to need to claim uh, credit for what has been achieved and, and seeing themselves as part of a kind of wider network of organizations who are all contributing something. I think we've seen quite a bit of it during the pandemic through necessity, and I would love to see that as a trend that continued. And then I think the uh, the final thing is, I think around some of the, the issues that we've been discussing around the kind of recognition of, of challenges around racial justice and around things like the environment, I would like to see more of a realization or acknowledgement across the world of philanthropy that they are not they shouldn't be seen as causes that it is a choice about whether or not to focus on as a funder or an organization mm -hmm. they are cross-cutting issues that every organization 
needs to take into account and ensure that it is factoring into the work that it does. So even if you don't see yourself as an environmental or racial justice funder, that doesn't matter. You still need to think through what your role is with respect to those kinds of challenges. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but- and I, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think that also speaks to this question of, of, of lenses rather than cause areas that people want to support. You know, these are these are lenses through which um, it's important to view all the questions and considerations that you have around your philanthropy um, and and certainly not sort of, you know, narrow corridors that you either enter or you don't. So um, that's a really helpful point. Thank you very much. So I just want to close by saying a huge thank you to Rodri, Sarah and Maureen for joining me today and sharing their thoughts. Uh, Challenge, um, as well as expertise, it's really appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Um, It's certainly given me much food for thought um, and I'm sure it will spark a lot of conversation uh, with our viewers. um, So thank you very much. I will close by saying that NPC's content is reliant on the wonderful support of our funders. We're a charity ourselves, so we need to generate income to keep bringing insights and conversations to the sector. If you're watching this and you'd like to hear more about our work, please do get in touch um, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.